Hi guys, and welcome to another episode. So yesterday the video went up at long last where uh, I asked you guys where we're going to go to, Olaf or Egil. So this episode will be continuing with the main story. But just before we do that, I want to make a quick detour because something's come up at long last, uh, which I'm finally really excited to show you. So um, I'll explain that in just a second. But the first thing we're going to have to do to, for me to show you this is uh, go back out into this big cave here and we're going to kill some Jotun. So when you kill Jotun, just like all enemies, well, most enemies in the game, they drop collectible items. Um, these guys drop Jotun pelts who you can give to collectors. Uh, we actually want five of them for this purpose. Some of you guys might know what's coming. Um, and uh, I'll actually be able to show you a new character who we could have met at any point in this whole Let's Play, but uh, he just hasn't come up at all until now, so I'm, I'm really quite excited to show you it. Um, while we're here, I will cut most of this, but while we're here, uh, I did want to bring something up. I There was actually an interesting point that somebody made um, in, the, uh, in the comments in one of the previous episodes. It'll probably be quite a while ago now, but... Um, we were talking about the Jotun, and in the official, I don't know if you guys read it, but in one of the descriptions for the videos, I put the official de description for the Jotun in there. And in the official description, I'm not quite sure where this comes from, whether it comes from the either North manuscripts or what, but apparently these guys, they're savages now, but a long time ago they used to, well, we don't even know how long ago really, but they used to be a very cultured, very loving race I guess and they used to live in these giant citadels it was said and now they're just savages that live in the old homes of their their grand ancestors which is a really cool idea I think um but more importantly that also reminded me of uh, someone on the forums a while ago was speculating that maybe the eye of the north you know a big mysterious building that's been abandoned by its creators in the the northern shiver peaks that would be quite interesting a lot of people always kind of say oh yeah the eye of the north is clearly Something to do with the Messart or the Sears or something like that or the Elder Dragons. I think it would be kind of cool if they turned around and said, no, 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 it's it's about the Jotun. And the Jotun are a, a lot more interesting than you might give them credit for when you first meet them. Uh, which is pretty cool. So, yeah. Uh, basically, we're just going to be killing these guys for... I was hoping to get a drop to show you guys one as an example. If not, I'll just show you when, when we've got them all. For their pelts. And once we've got five pelts, we'll continue on with the main story. So, I'll see you guys in a second. Alright, okay, there we go. Got all five of them. That was really easy. It only took me a very short little while. So if you look at my inventory here, I've got five Jotun pelts. Very, very cool. Very quick. Uh, and let's speak to Sif about going to check out where Egil is. Never anger um, so she's Sif, Northern Allies. Oh, what do you want? Where can we find Egil Fireteller? Egil Fireteller lives in the middle of Yaga Moraine, northeast of here. Okay, cool. So, uh, we'll go there. Also, remember last episode? Last episode? One of the episodes. I got this Hero's Handbook. We still haven't read from it. Uh, basically, the first page explains how we got here. It explains us looking through the depths, which I'm not going to read out because it's pretty basic. We know all of that. If you really want to read it, it does not get any interesting insights at all. But if you do, just pause the video there. I don't mind. Um, we'll go through. This page we'll read later with Peter. Um, but we can read this one. So Ogden feels our best course for survival is rallying allies against the destroyers. After being chased from the depths, I can see his point. Precious few dwarves and humans live in this land, and the few who do aren't here to hunt monsters. The largest group of natives in the mountain are the Norn, a proud, independent race of huge, shape-shifting warriors. The first Norn we met, Jora, was friendlier than most, but she has lost her ability to become the bear. Because she can't change her shape, she has little status among her people, but she may be our best hope for convincing the Norn that the destroyers are a threat. Ogden certainly hopes so. Okay, um, and then we actually helped her get a gift back. So Jorah was cursed when she entered a taboo area. She lost her shape-shifting ability while her brother transformed into the monstrous Norn Bear. I love this idea, by the way, that she lost the ability altogether and he was completely corrupted by it. They're just complete, two completely different opposite ends of the scale. It's pretty cool the way that happened. Uh, with our aid, Jorah confronted and defeated her brother. To show her gratitude, she has joined our group. Ogden is now searching for Olaf, Olafson, and other powerful Norn who can aid us in our quest. Jorah must seek out Egil Fireteller, an elder Norn who can teach her how to regain her honour. I think we can do both, though Ogden grows more frustrated by the day. Alright, so there we go. Nice little recap for you guys. Let's get on out and let's do the episode. It's nice and bright and early in the morning. It's about 8 o'clock, actually. I think this is the earliest episode I've I've ever filmed, which is quite shameful, I guess. But um, I'm trying to like sort of do a new thing where I do an episode really early in the morning and then go do stuff and then come back. So... 
We'll see how it works out. It's pretty good. It's pretty good being up like this. So, uh, Halverdan the Younger. Who sent My entire hunting party vanished. I bet they were killed by beasts. We've already spoke to you, haven't we? Yeah, we've already actually been out here for a little while. Uh, Yaga Moraine. Uh, what quests have we got? Northern Allies. Why don't we have the primary quest? Um, oh, we've just got to find him. Oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, so again, yes. No, uh, no quest marker. Oh, no, there is a quest marker. Okay, I'll just shut up now. All right, so we're going to go up here to this little... Um, Basically, Egil was just a hermit. He's he's a bit like um, Hogni. Hogni, that's the one. I almost forgot his name there. Yeah, he's a bit like Hogni, um, who just kind of. I, I guess that's the way of the Norn. You actually find out that the Norn really don't like to settle. They're a bit like the Luxons in that way. Uh, the Gunnar's Hold is quite weird. It's a big settlement. Typically, Norn don't do that so much. I think uh, the idea is they, they, they like to move around. They like to explore the world a lot more. And they, they spend a lot of time on their own or out hunting. You know, if a Norn's not hunting, if he's just stagnating, he's not creating his own legend. He's not creating a story to die with. So, yeah, they're always kind of on the move. In fact, um, the main settlement for Norn in Guild Wars 2 is basically just a load of, uh, just a congregation of, wow, look at all of these bison. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. It's basically just a congregation of loads of, oh, I hate these bison. Well, actually, no, I really like them, but Jesus, look at them all. Who are they eating? They're eating Sin and Harta right in the middle of there. We'll try and get you out. Don't worry. But yeah, it's just a, a load of Norn settlements that slowly sort of came together. It was never... Nobody ever founded a city or anything like that. That's just the way it happened. I need to take out their monks. Where's their monks? Well, I could have seen that coming any day. I love... Look at the fur on that Aurox. That's so cool. I've never noticed that before. That's quite detailed, actually. If you think... Oh, well, I don't know how well you guys on YouTube could see that, but that was pretty cool. I never really... See, the game's kind of annoying because enemies... There's always so many enemies where it's an eight-man game, right? There's obviously a lot of enemies to scale up to account for that fact. And you never really get to appreciate what a lot of them look like because they're always in such big groups. They always end up just clipping into each other and looking like shit. And the other thing that's annoying is whenever they get hit by, by stuff, can you see they're flashing red? That flash is still there in Guild Wars 2 and it really pisses me off because it isn't needed. Obviously, it's been put there to show, oh yes, the impact is happening. But please, don't do Especially on big monsters, right? Uh, I'm sure you're all, well, a lot of you are familiar with the Shatterer fight. A massive dragon. Dragon. It's one of the champions of Kraukatoric. It was in the first ever demo. It's huge. It's an amazing dynamic event. The only thing that really pisses me off about it, and now that I've talked about it, you guys will probably notice it as well. It's one of those things. But the only thing that really pisses me off about that fight is the whole way through it, he just stands there flashing white constantly. I mean constantly. He's just sat there flashing white, and it's so stupid. It, why is it there? It's so much more noticeable on the big enemies, like the Oak Hearts as well. Just, just get rid of it, please. I mean, it's not needed. Maybe on small things, I don't mind so much. But And obviously when it's a solo game, they won't be flashing like mad. Unless you're in a dynamic event, like with the Shatterer, when everybody, you know, you've got 50 people attacking the same thing. But in any case, it's one of those little pet peeves I have, I must say. I, I really don't think it's necessary. There's anything that can break your immersion. If you, Even if you play like this, it still happens. You know, and it is possible to play like this. It's just very hard, as I demonstrated kind of with my factions let's play well we were pretty much playing like that we had a skill bar the <laughs> turning off the skill bar is going to make the game a lot harder um but kudos to anyone who actually tries it i think you can still use skills um i don't know i can't tell if i can because of all the freaking allies you can still attack people i know that much yeah see look i can attack oh i'm blind yeah you can use skills look at that well yeah Maybe that's a challenge for you guys then. Anyway, I think I'll stop <laughs> rambling about crap now and uh, speed it up till we get north a bit. Or at least for these fields, because we've seen these already, so. In all their majesty. Gun life, hello. Why are you here? I'm here to fight. Isn't that all, what all good Norn do? No? Who sent you?
All right, okay, we're out of that southern section. We get an, a nice avalanche warning here, which we can read. Danger, loose snowpack, high risk of avalanche. Wait, what the hell were we just attacking? Were we attacking the sign? Uh, okay, right, so yeah, uh, we get an avalanche warning. That might not be a hundred... Oh, mandragores. That might not be 100% clear. Uh, basically, for this quest, we're going to be coming up here, um, and then we won't see much more of the explorable area, but not particularly further north, which is where all the really cool stuff happens. But do you remember these other... Um, hunts these bounties down here at Sephala. We will be getting those pretty soon. I think, if not during this filming session, the next one. And uh, once we've done that, uh, we'll be able to see all kinds of awesome places up here. Just like the previous one kind of gave us a tour of Jokar Lake as well. If you think about it, that's the only section of Jokar Lake we've not been to. But, um, yeah. Okay, this place is pretty nice as well, I think. I like this place. So, Egil. I think Egil's the only guy here, though. I mean, it's quite a big, like, stead, but he's, he's the only guy here. Anyway, hello, Egil. Jora uh, is with us, and she needs some help. How can she regain her, on her honor? Ah, oh, and I love his armor. Look at that. Brilliant. Okay. Take a knee and listen up. It's story time. Okay, uh, let's listen to a story. Egil, I would like to t hear a story. So this is another big thing of Norn culture. They love to tell stories. They've got lots of skulls and stuff. Okay, so the Norn do not know gods, at least not in the way humans do. But we do revere the spirits of the animals upon whom we depend for food and shelter. All right, so this is quite an another important thing I haven't really talked about, but I guess I've kind of alluded to a lot. Um... All the playable races, these races we're meeting now, the ones that are playable in Guild Wars 2, they all have different religions, different outlooks on life, uh, and completely different world views, basically. Which is quite cool, but it also means that in Guild Wars 2, the gods, you know, these big mysterious things, which pretty much I think everybody <laughs> loves to speculate on most, are, are, are going to take a bit of a backseat. And that's not just true because all the different playable races have got different religions in Guild Wars 2, but also because of, of course, what happened at the end of Nightfall. Now that Abaddon's been defeated, the, the gods seem to think it's okay to leave and you remember the avatar of Lissa said that it's our world now so there is much less of an influence on the human gods but a lot more influence on other people's religion which is really cool I, I like the way they did that um so, there are many such spirits. Bear is the mightiest, of course, but raven, owl, wolf, worm, and ox all have their place in the world and our hearts. So, remember in the previous episode I was mentioning there are other spirits? We will only see skills to do with the bear, the raven, and the wolf. Uh, and we'll only see Norn in Guild Wars 1 turn into bears. But there are all of these cool spirits. In fact, there's a couple of spirits. Snow Leopard comes to mind, uh, which Norn, can actually tra Norn players can actually transform to in, in Guild Wars 2 and many others. Uh, there's some actually referenced in the in the Eye of the North manuscript that didn't even appear in the game, I don't think, not even in dialogue. Uh, but yeah, there are all of these spirits. It's pretty cool, isn't it? I think they're supposed to be spirits for everything, pretty much. Even stuff like rocks, inanimate things, I think. Trees, they all have spirits. They're just kind of lesser spirits. And Norn don't re revere them as much as they revere these ones. And as I said before, they change. Like, some of the, the spirits die in the fight with Jormag and stuff. Whatever dying may mean. While we hunt and slay these creatures, we also praise their spirit and thank them for their sacrifice. The animals are our brethren. Their spirits guide us as we live and hunt. There are more hostile, even malicious spirits in the world. Spirits of the mountains, seasons, fire and darkness. The animal spirits are our allies against these foes and we thank them for their aid, singing the praises of all beasts as we hunt. This is the Norn way. So it's pretty cool, they've got such a weird blend of Viking and Native American cultures and all kinds of stuff thrown in there. They're, they're brilliant. Okay, so thank you. That's a bit more on Norn culture. Uh, enough of that though, let's hear about Jorah. What can, what can we do? Flames of the Bear Spirit. It's good to see that Jorah can once again become the bear. Now, mayhap, she may regain her status. There is but one obstacle, one mountain she must yet climb. Her clan, Homestead, is overrun with char. No respected Norn would allow the land to be violated by such beasts. If you can help Jorah reclaim her lands, only then will she be able to help you. You will need all the strength of Bear herself to defeat the Char. We must commune with the Bear Spirit and seek counsel. Let us journey to the sacred altar south of here. We will light the spiritual flame. Bear will come if our cause is true. I will be glad to aid Jorah. So also another interesting thing there is that they, they seem to think of Bear as a female spirit. I don't know why that happens, um, I don't know whether all spirits are female, well no, I think some are male, I don't know why they give gender to them, but there you go. Egil says, sorry, the bear spirit is the strength of the mountains, we're going to get a move on while I read this out to the south. 
The bear spirit is the strength of the mountains. The Norn, owe the, the Norn owe bear more than just our prowess in battle. We owe our homes and our lives to bear. You must show your strength of spirit by protecting the sacred flame. Only once the bear spirit has deemed you worthy will she appear. Show your strength, small one, and prove your worth. I will aid you in this ritual. So, Egil's coming with us. There he is. I just love him. He's so big. It makes whatever weapon he wields. So this is the same for all Norn. Just look awesome. And a spear and shield isn't a bad place to start. Okay, so yeah, we're going to come south. This is actually an impenetrable wall here, which is a really kind of cool area. You can't just, like, cut across. Um, you have to kind of go up and through the rocks at a, a different place. And we're going to go to a really... Uh, another pretty interesting area in the explorable in the explorable area. And it's interesting whether you're doing this quest or not. A lot of people farm there. Um, but yeah, I'll talk about when we get to it. Before that, though, I'm, I'm afraid we have a lot of mandragore to fight, I think. Is that another house? Oh no, that's a wall. Wow, one big wall that is. See, another thing about the Norn is their architecture. They love to build big. In, in Guild Wars 2, all of the the playable races' cities do look very distinct. And uh, if you guys have seen videos of Divinity's Reach or Lion's Arch, that promo video, you'll know just kind of the scale that all of the cities are at. And the Norn, it's just, it's, it's not even the same league as them. Every building is about... 50 times the height of your character if you're a Norn. And Norn are like 7, 8 foot. That is crazy. It's absolutely huge. I, I do get the, the impression that their buildings just feel a bit sort of hollow and, and you'd imagine them to be quite echoing. They're not as busy or interesting as the other places. So for that reason, I'm not as keen on that as like Divinity's Reach or or the other places we, we, we've seen clips of. But it is pretty cool that they build big stuff. I mean, you do lose a lot of sense of scale in this game because you can zoom the camera out so far. This whole Let's Play, I'll try and play zoomed in so that you keep the sense of scale. But it still doesn't really do anything. I mean, this is a huge arch. Actually, think about this. This is huge. This isn't huge compared to barely anything we've seen in Guild Wars. I mean, look at that building over there. But because we're always zoomed out like this, you barely see anything. And that's because you've always got so many things walking around you. It is annoying to play like this because if you turn around, everything just clutters the screen. Especially in combat. Uh, so what they've done in Guild Wars 2 to remedy that, which is actually quite cool in my opinion, but a lot of people get kind of pissed off with it, as far as I can see, is uh, the 